Good evening, Six Packers. Welcome back to Sharing the Catholic Faith. Uh, I'm thrilled to death to have you. Uh, th this is a beautiful day. It's Sunday, and it's a beautiful day in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri. Uh, we've got beautiful weather. The honeysuckles look like they'll be in full bloom in another day or so. We've had the house open up all day for fresh air. It's gorgeous. But uh, it, springtime has come. It's. I hope it's beautiful where you're at, too, because it is, it is beautiful here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, we've always got new people that register for the webinar every week. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Uh, please forgive me for not going into the litany of things that I'm supposed to tell you. <laughs> let's let's just all sum it up all uh, sum it all up by saying that I'm a consecrated Marian catechist under the direction of Leo uh, Raymond Leo Cardinal Burke, and uh, that should pretty well suffice for everything. Uh, as we go through tonight's presentation, your subject to have questions, please, if you have a question, type it into the chat box right then, because if you wait until question time, chances are you're going to forget it, and if you type it into the chat box and send it to me, I, I'll, I'll see it's there, but I won't deal with it until question time, uh, but we'll be able to handle any questions you have. Uh, but if you have a question later on or a question that you don't want to ask on the webinar, uh, you can always go to the joe6packanswers.com website to the Ask Joe page, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any Catholic question you have. I get questions every single week, and uh, uh, why people don't ask them on the uh, uh, webinar is beyond me, but uh, that's okay. I'm I'm happy to answer them anytime, any place. Okay. Now, uh, I want to take also want to take a second to uh, throw in a little commercial here. The Cantankerous Catholic Podcast comes out every Wednesday morning. You can listen to it anytime you want. Uh, and you can get it from Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you download your podcasts, wherever you listen to them. But uh, you can also come to cantankerouscatholic.com uh, and get it there. Uh, there's also access to my show notes and other things as well. Now, before we start with an opening word of prayer, I have something I want to tell you. The country, the country is beginning to open up again. Few people still have access to mass, and uh, I think that's a, a sinful shame. It's terrible that we don't have access to mass yet. But uh, as I said, the country's opening up. Springtime is here. Uh, people are going to want to get out a lot, and I can't blame them. We haven't been out of the house for a month here uh, at Joe's house. And so uh, I this, this is the last presentation in the series. And I'm going to go ahead and take a summer break because people are going to get into their activities and all that. But I have to admit I have a selfish motive too. I've been doing this every week for over three years, and to be perfectly honest, I'm tired. I need a break. So uh, besides, I'm working on courses to put on my website for you folks, and I am uh, I, I fortunately have some help with some other things from uh, a beautiful couple from down in Alabama. And uh, uh, so maybe between the three of us, we can get a whole lot done so that whenever we start these webinars up again uh, at the end of the summer, uh, you know, we can have a lot more people, have a lot more fun, learn a whole lot more, okay? Uh, 
and I'm sure that, by the way, this week you're going to want to listen to my podcast. It's, it's going to be very important. Now, we're going to have our opening word of prayer, but please, we are invoking God, asking him to bless us here. Let's please be courteous of God. I'll have things to say after the closing prayer. You don't want to listen to them, that's fine. But please, once we say our opening prayer, please, Stay with the webinar until we thank God for uh, being with us in this webinar, okay? Okay, so let's begin with an opening word of prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Third person of the Blessed Trinity, soul of our souls, we ask that you open our hearts and minds to know what is truth, help us to imbibe those truths, and then to live by them. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I Listen, I notice uh, looking at the attendees, I recognize some names. You've heard this before. You've heard this before. Why, for you new folks, why do these people keep coming back? Because repetition is the best teacher, and they want to come back, and they want to you know, you always learn something that you didn't hear the first time, or it didn't, it just didn't cross your mind the first time. So that's why these folks keep coming back. In fact, I notice two names of people who've been with me almost the entire time I've been doing this. So they've been with me for three years anyway. And that's a great thing. Uh, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you a whole lot. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about the life of prayer, uh, first of all, uh, mental, vocal, and aspirational prayer. Now, what is prayer? Well, prayer is raising our hearts and minds to God in loving conversations so that we can ask for his good in our lives. Uh, why should we pray? We should pray to God to adore him thank him for his blessings, ask forgiveness, and beg him for the graces we need. How should we pray? As Jesus himself taught us through word and example, we should pray with an awareness of God's presence, humility, confidence, and perseverance. For whom should we pray? Oh, I always like this one. We should pray for ourselves, our friends and loved ones, sinners, probably the most forgotten group ever, the poor souls in purgatory, and all those in authority, the religious priests, bishops, also pray for the laity, uh, and we most especially should pray for the Pope. Uh, in other words, who do we pray for? Everyone. <laughs> uh, let's see. I clicked it and it didn't turn. Um uh, does God always hear our prayers? Is this thing going to turn or not? Ah, okay. Yeah, God always hears our prayers if we pray well. Uh, let me see if it's going to go to the next one. Will God always give us what we pray for? Well, now that's a different question. The people... I've heard all kinds of really, well, I've heard good answers on this, but I've never really heard a complete answer. Uh, so everybody seems to hone in uh, on God, on Jesus' promise in Matthew, uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount uh, in Matthew is the longest uh, the longest explanation or, or explication of, of the Sermon on the Mount. And I certainly urge you to read it, but the promise that he made is near the end of the sermon, okay? It's near the end of the sermon. There's a reason for that. Uh, in Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Uh, knock, and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks, receive, and he who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, boy, Jesus was never one to uh, was never one to soft soap it. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things for those who ask Him? Look, God's love is unconditional, but the benefits He offers us aren't unconditional. Okay, people love to home in on the promise he made. I've had a lot of people tell me, you know, I've I've given up on prayer. I've given up on God. God never answers my prayer. Well, that's really because they're not paying attention to the conditions Jesus set, and he did set conditions. Uh, the promise Jesus made about prayer comes near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, but prior to that, he gives a lot of conditions for the promise. For example, he talks against anger. Uh, he talks about chastity of mind and body, speaks against divorce, warns us about oaths, tells us to love our enemies, tells us to have a purity of intention, tells us to do penance. He tells us to trust in God. Uh, Let's see. Okay. Uh, tells us to trust in God, and he also tells us to avoid being judgmental of other people. So until you do all these things, don't expect God to be a heavenly slot machine. It won't happen. It, you know, you, you wouldn't have respect for anyone who you just told them, hey, this is what I want, and they do it without question, you know, no conditions, no nothing, or if people did you that way, you wouldn't feel respected, would you? If you had someone you were doing this with, you wouldn't respect them. God puts conditions on things, and these are some of the conditions he put. So if you're doing all these things, uh, you can probably expect God to answer some prayers more uh, more to your liking, I guess you'd say. Now, if you're doing all these things, though, it begs the question, will God let you win the lottery because uh, you ask him for it? Well, if you're already doing everything Jesus asked in the Sermon on the Mount, your prayer intentions are going to be more closely aligned uh, and united to the mind of God. So I'll just leave it by saying you do the math, okay? Now, what is mental prayer? Well, mental prayer uh, is made within our minds, uniting our th uh, thoughts and hearts to God. What is vocal prayer? Vocal prayer is praying with words, but we're to unite our words with our heart and mind. In other words, don't pray a mindless Hail Mary. Don't pray a mindless Our Father. Uh, think about what you're praying and 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 uh, uh, unite your heart and mind with it, okay? What is an aspiration? Well, this is a short prayer. A good example would be a prayer like uh, My Jesus Mercy. My personal favorite is uh, out of sacred scripture, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Uh, we all need help with our faith sometimes. I, I need it most of the time, I guess. Uh, or that wouldn't be my favorite aspiration. And you can really get in the habit of doing aspirations. They're very beneficial. For example, you can pick uh, a place in the house that you maybe pass 30 or 40 times a day. And uh, every time you see this thing that you've chosen or this place that you've chosen, you can say your little aspiration as you're walking by. Uh, when I was still working, uh, I had like, uh, at the router table, I would say an aspiration at the, uh, uh, at my carving bench, I would say an aspiration It you know, when I passed them and that's just something you can get in the habit of doing. And it's very beneficial. Now, 
Uh, okay, it's not going to flip. I don't know if these things are flipping on time for you folks, but they don't flip on time for me, and I can't read what the slide says. Which prayers should we memorize? Well, the minimum prayers that every Catholic should memorize are, ah, there it is, okay, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be to the Father, the Apostles' Creed, Act of Faith, Act of Hope, Act of Charity, Act of Contrition, which I hope you're saying every week. <laughs> uh, let's see. The Rosary and the Rosary. Now, uh, the first three, first four prayers in this list are part of the Rosary. But uh, the Rosary is more than just four prayer, actually five prayers if you include the Fatima prayer. No, six prayers, the Ave Maria. But it's actually more than just a series of prayers because the key to the rosary are the meditations. I've, you know, we've got four sets of meditations, uh, mysteries, we call them. And that's very, very important uh, that you focus on those and and meditate on those. Now, are distractions in prayer sinful? Well, they can be venially sinful if, if they're deliberate. Uh, but if they're not deliberate and you refuse to dwell on them, your prayers become even more pleasing to God. An example out of uh, uh, the little flower's life. Workmen one time were doing uh, some renovations in the chapel where she was... Uh, uh, doing her holy hour and gosh, lots of noise, hammer banging, saw, uh, making it sound all this noise going on. And later on, she said, and it was because she fought the distractions. It was one of the best holy hours she ever made. Okay. So, you know, prayer is a matter of concentration as much as anything else. Now, is it good to use our own words in prayer? Well, look, I like formulated prayers because they're well thought out and they cover all the bases, so to speak. Um, however, the prayers that you have that are impromptu, now those are especially pleasing to God because that's how we develop an intimate relationship with God. Why is the Our Father a perfect prayer? Well, the Our Father is a perfect prayer because Jesus, who is himself perfect, taught it to us. Um, it's perfect because we ask first for God's glory and then everything we need, both spiritually and materially, for ourselves and for everyone. According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Lord's Prayer is truly the summary of the whole gospel. Uh, it is at the center of the scriptures. And I want to make one comment. Uh, I think it was about six months ago, the Pope started talking about, Pope Francis started talking about changing the wording of the Our Father and removing the phrase, uh, protect us from temptation. That is to imply that Jesus didn't know what he was doing. Uh, fortunately, I haven't heard anything else about it. I haven't heard any other rumblings about it, but I just want you to know, uh, <laughs> well, we'll talk about that sometime. We'll talk about the Pope's authority and you're, you're going to want to listen to my podcast episode this week. You really are, uh, because we're going to talk about Pope Francis and some of the things he's doing. Okay. Uh, there, I clicked it again. It didn't turn for me, but somebody sent me a message saying the slides are turning for you. Uh, so the next thing, you know, if you want, I could offer an entire course on the spiritual life in the Bible. Now, in such a course, I'd uh, cover the enemies of the spiritual life and how to overcome them. Uh, let's see, I'd uh, uh, talk about the benefits of meditation and the benefits of spiritual reading. Uh, I don't know that I'm the best teacher for these things because I'm just about the worst Catholic I know, but I'd try. Uh, however, because, uh, uh, because the length of this lesson, 
Uh, we're just going to skip on uh, to talk about the Bible, okay? Now, first of all, uh, this is the Bible I recommend. I recommend the, uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, I'm sorry, this is the Bible I recommend. It doesn't have to be uh, a uh, an Ignatius Bible, although, you know, that's from Ignatius Press and it's very, very good. But I recommend the Revised Standard Version Catholic Edition. And the reason for that is because... Uh, it's the most accurate English translation available. The uh, Bible scholars, whenever they need an English translation, this is the one they turn to. They don't turn to the Douay Reims or the Vulgate uh, in English, or uh, they don't turn to anything except this because of its accuracy. And... Uh, so I highly recommend this. This is the one I use for my daily reading. However, I do recommend this. This one is no longer in print. It hasn't been in print for years. The only place I've ever found that has it is Loom Theological Booksellers. Now, you might want to write down that phone number. Uh, why do I recommend this? Well, look. It's a good version. It's not as accurate as the Revised Standard Version. However, for a Bible to be called a Catholic Bible, it has to have church-approved footnotes. They're not necessarily the same footnotes in every Bible, but they have to be church-approved. And frankly, the footnotes in this thing are amazing. I've been using... Uh, I've been using the confraternity version for, gosh, 25 years, and it is absolutely amazing in the footnotes. And it, it's good to compare uh, compare it to uh, uh, the Revised Standard Version anyway, so you can get a better grasp of what's going on. But what I will do sometimes is I'll read a passage in Scripture, and hmm, what does the church say about that? And I'll look at the footnote in the uh, revised standard version and i'll say well okay but i you know i'm not really <laughs> pleased with that footnote it doesn't give me enough and so i will turn to uh uh this one the uh conference saint joseph textbook edition confraternity version and uh uh read the footnote in there and boy it quite often opens up, in fact, usually opens up some good doors for me. So, you know, this, I, I highly recommend you get this and the Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition. Now, what is the Bible? Well, the Bible, you're, you're going to, you're going to enjoy this. The Bible is the book which contains God, this section anyway. The Bible is the book which contains God's inspired word. It was written by men inspired by the Holy Spirit, so they would write only what he wanted written. God speaks to us through the Bible and his church, which alone has the authority to interpret Scripture and helps us to understand best what he is saying to us. Uh, how is the Bible divided? Well, the Bible is divided into two parts. The Old Testament, which consists of 46 books, and the New Testament, which consists of 27 books. Now, what is the Old Testament? I'm going to, look, we're going to do this slide and the next one, then I'm going to comment and pull it all together in a way you may never have heard it pulled together before. The Old Testament was written before the birth of Christ. It tells us the history of God's people and the first covenant with, and his first covenant with them, actually several covenants. Uh, it shows how God prepared his people for the coming of Christ. What is the New Testament? Well, this was written after Jesus' return to the Father in heaven. It tells us about the birth, life, teachings, passion, death, resurrection, and ascension. It also tells us about life in the early church. Finally, working with sacred tradition, uh, the New Testament, indeed the whole Bible, 
uh, teaches us how to apply Christ's teachings to our own lives. Now look, the way I want to pull this together is to say this. Everything, everything from the very uh, first verse in Genesis to the very last verse in Revelation, this is what it does. It prepares us for the coming of Christ and the establishment of his church for our sanctity. And then it shows us uh, how he, how the early church was lived in and thrived. And it also tells us the end of the church. The Bible is a manual, is a, it's a, uh, is a manual for the church. That's what it's all about. And if you read both testaments with that, uh, uh, with that perspective, the Bible comes to life in a much more meaningful way. It really does. And Catholics are notorious for not reading sacred scripture. They think that, okay, I go to mass and I get the readings there. That's enough for me. No, it's not. The Bible is a beautiful gift from God. And very few things, well, frankly, very few things give me more pleasure in life than the uh, uh, than the Bible does, reading the Bible. Uh, I hope you begin to undertake reading the Bible if you don't already. Now, how should we read the Bible? Well, first and foremost, read it prayerfully, okay? In order, that, that's the only way you're going to gain what God wants you to gain from it. But you also have to read it humbly because uh, humility in reading the Bible, keeping in mind what the church teaches, uh, uh, helps you to avoid a personal private interpretation of Scripture that leads to a false interpretation, okay? Now let's talk about inspiration of the Bible. Before we really get into the inspiration, there are a few things I need to say about the Bible, and some of these things are going to shock some of you. Some of you are going to be a little bit shocked by them. First of all, the Bible came from the church, not the church from the Bible. It does not, okay? Uh, I've, I've heard people make the ridiculous statement, well, you know, they, I've heard them say that Paul, stood, Paul and Silas stood on the street corners of Jerusalem and handed out the King James Bible. Obviously, Catholics didn't say that, but I've heard that. And these are people who believe that the church came from the Bible, and it didn't. The Bible came from the church, and only the church. Uh, the next thing is that it is not the sole rule of faith. Uh, that was an error that uh, uh, Martin Luther came up with in 1517. Uh, he said all you need is the Bible, and that's not true. The Bible itself denies that, and sometime uh, we'll go through the apologetic on that, and I'll prove it. I will prove that the Bible admits that it doesn't have everything in several places. Uh, the next thing is that uh, I can't see the slide and it hasn't turned here yet. Uh, oh, come on, man. Okay. Uh, there we go. It's not necessary. The Bible is not necessary. That's the one that I'm sure is shocking. Some of you are saying, oh, he's a heretic. No, I'm not a heretic. The Bible is not necessary. If we had never been given the Bible, Jesus gave us the church. He didn't command anybody to write a book. He didn't command anybody to produce a Bible. What he did command was his apostles to... Uh, run the church that he established. He gave the chair of Peter uh, and the church infallibility in matters of faith and morals. The Bible is a beautiful, beautiful gift, and I love it to pieces. I've read it four times all the way through, uh, you know, from cover to cover, but I spend most of my time in the New Testament, and it's 
it's still just as fresh and alive as it ever was to me. Uh, so the Bible's beautiful, but it is not necessary. Absolutely not necessary. Uh, <laughs> this is stopping up again, and I can't read the slide on the side here. Oh, yeah. The church did not add books to the Bible. Look, uh, the uh, Protestants claim that we added books to the Bible. We changed the Bible. And that's not true. They took books out of the Bible. They took seven books out of the Old Testament. They also took out parts of Esther and parts of uh, uh, Daniel. And furthermore, they uh, uh, Martin Luther wanted to take out the book of James because the book of James refutes his uh, belief in sola fide, by faith alone. Uh, so don't ever let anyone tell you that we changed the Bible. We took books out of the Bible. We didn't. We gave them the Bible, and they destroyed it, okay? <coughs> oh, excuse me. I didn't mean to cough on you. Okay. Another thing, the Bible is not inspired because it says so. Uh, look, just because a book says it's inspired doesn't make it so, and we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, the Quran that Muslims use claims to be inspired. The Book of Mormon claims to be inspired. Uh, in Christian science, the writings of Mary Baker Eddy claim to be inspired. Do you believe for a minute that any of those things are inspired? No, of course we don't. Uh, that's, that's ridiculous. Okay. And finally, I know the slide changed for you, but it hasn't changed for me yet. And I can't see what it says. Uh, there it is. The dictation theory is not possible. Common belief among many Christians, and sadly, even some Catholics, is that God whispered into the ear of the sacred writers. And that can't possibly be true. If it is, or if, if, if it were true, then that means God's imperfect. Because, for example, in, uh, uh, in Paul, in one of his epistles, talks about he can't remember who he, uh, who he baptized. I, you know, I may have baptized this one and that one, but I can't remember. Okay, so we're to believe with the dictation theory that God couldn't remember who Paul baptized? No, I don't think so. This is uh, simply not possible, okay? So don't let anyone tell you that that's, uh, that's how we got the Bible. We're going to talk about some of this here in a few minutes because from here on, uh, from here on what I want to do is prove the inspiration of the Bible, okay? Uh, and I, my slide will change. Good grief. Okay, let's do another one. The Bible, uh, our first step is to approach the Bible as we would any other ancient work. From textual criticism, we're able to conclude that we have a text that is accurate. Uh, indeed, we're more certain of the Bible's accuracy than any other uh, ancient work. Uh, Sir Frederick Kenyon notes, for all the works of classical antiquity, we have to depend on manuscripts long after their original composition. The author, who is the best case in this respect, is Virgil, uh, yet the earliest manuscript of Virgil that we now possess was written some 350 years after his death. For all other classical writers, the interval between the death of the author and the earliest extant manuscript of his work is much greater. Uh, for example, for Livy, it was about 500 years. Uh, for Horace, about 900 years. For most of Plato, uh, it would be 1,300 years. And for Euripides, 1,600 years. Yet no one seriously disputes that we have accurate copies of the works of these writers. 
Not only are the biblical manuscripts we have older than for classical authors, uh, we have in absolute numbers far more manuscripts. Uh, some are whole books of the Bible. Others are fragments or just a few words. But there are thousands of manuscripts in Hebrew, Greek, Latin, Coptic, Syriac, and other languages. Uh, what that means is that we can be sure we have an accurate text and we can work from it with confidence. Now, next we look at the Bible, considered merely as history. Uh, it tells us particularly the New Testament uh, and most particularly the Gospels. Uh, we examine the account of Jesus' life and death and his reported resurrection. Using what is in the Gospels themselves, what we find in extra-biblical writings from the early centuries, and what we know of human nature, and what we can otherwise know uh, from natural theology of divine nature, we conclude that Jesus either was what he claimed to be, which is God, or he was a madman. Uh, the one thing we know he couldn't have been was merely a good man uh, who wasn't God because no merely good man would make the claims he made. We're able to eliminate his being a madman, not just from what he said. No madman ever spoke uh, as he did, and for that matter, no sane man did either. But from what his followers did after his death, uh, the hoax of an empty tomb is one thing, but you don't find people dying for a hoax, at least not uh, not because not uh, one from which they have no prospect of advantage. The result of this line of reasoning is that we must conclude that Jesus indeed rose from the dead and that he was therefore God and being God, meant what he said and did what he said he would do. Uh, one thing he said he would do was found a church for, uh, and from the, both the Bible, still taken merely as a historical book, not at this point uh, in the argument an inspired book, uh, and other ancient works, we see that Christ established a church with the rudiments of all we see in the Catholic Church today, papacy, hierarchy, priesthood, sacraments, teaching authority, and as a consequence of the teaching authority, infallibility. Uh, Christ's church, to do what he said it would do, would have to have this note of infallibility. We've thus far taken purely historical material and concluded there exists a church, which is the Catholic Church, divinely protected against teaching error. Now for the last part of the argument. Uh, which is the church tells us the Bible is inspired and we can take the church's word for it precisely because the church is infallible. Only after having been told by a properly constituted authority, that is one set up by God to assure us of the truth of the matters of faith, that the Bible is inspired, do we begin to use it as an inspired book? Now, I like the way uh, Sir Arnold Lunn put it in a 1932 letter to a uh, uh, British philosopher. Did I get that? There we go. To British philosopher uh, and radio personality, C.E.M. Jode. He was a scoundrel, by the way, but I, I don't. Arnold Lunn never converted him, which is sad. Uh, this is what he wrote. We now approach the Bible and approach it in the same spirit as that in which we should approach any other human document. We do not believe the Bible merely because it is the Bible, but because we are convinced of its veracity by rational inferences, similar in kind to those which convince us of other historical facts. We do not, for instance, accept the fact that Christ rose from the dead merely because we find the resurrection recorded in the Gospels. We accept the resurrection because of all the theories which have been put forward to explain the origin of Christianity. The only theory which fits all the facts is the theory that Jesus of Nazareth claimed to be God 
and proved his claim by rising from the dead. The Roman Catholic then claims to prove the Bible, which he is still treating as a purely human document, that Christ intended to found an infallible church. Where then is this church? The Roman Catholic Church alone possesses, so the Catholic believes, all the notes which enable us to distinguish between the church which Christ founded and its heretical rivals. The Catholic claims to uh, prove by pure reason, and I love this, unfortunately nobody follows reason anymore. Nobody knows how to use reason, it seems. The Catholic claims to prove by pure reason that Christ was God, that Christ founded an infallible church, and that the Roman Catholic Church is the church in question. Having traveled thus far by reason, unaided by authority, it is not irrational to trust the authority, uh, whose credentials have been proven by reason to interpret difficult passages in the Bible. That was the argument that uh, he used to Job, and it was a good argument. So I want you to know that in this argument, it's not a circular argument. We're not basing the inspiration of the Bible on the church's infallibility and the church's infallibility on the word of an inspired Bible. That really would be a circular argument. What we really have here is a spiral argument. On the first level, we argue to the reliability of the Bible as history. From that, we conclude an infallible church was founded. Then we take the word of that infallible church that the Bible is inspired. It reduces to the proposition that without the existence of the church, we couldn't tell if the Bible were inspired. It's as St. Augustine said, I would not believe in the gospel if the authority of the Catholic Church did not move me to do so. Let me repeat what Augustine said. I would not believe in the gospel if the authority of the Catholic Church did not move me to do so. Okay, folks, it's question time. Please send me your questions if you haven't already. Let's see what I've got here. Uh, I hope you will talk about the book Infiltration, The Plot to Destroy the Church from Within by Taylor Marshall. I am reading it, and it has some very eye-opening information that all Catholics need to read. I disagree with you. I know Taylor. I used to attend Mass with Taylor. Uh, he's a wonderful man, a wonderful Catholic, but he has a tendency to go a bit overboard on that sort of thing. And... I would urge you to find competent sources uh, for some of the eye-opening information that all Catholics need to read and verify what he's writing. Sometimes Taylor uh, goes with sites and uh, uh, resources that are biased and not all that accurate, okay? I do not believe for a second that uh, Taylor has any, um, you know, I, I don't think he has any personal agenda. I think he really believes what he's writing, but there are things there that I think are not safe. And so I would, you know, by all means, read the book, read every Catholic book you can read, but, uh, you know, check it out. Don't don't just accept it on the basis of it being Taylor Marshall or on the basis of what he says because it's something maybe you want to believe, okay? Um, I would be very cautious. Okay, what should, what, what I should have said above is talk about it uh, this coming week about the book. Oh, well, uh, okay. No, uh, I just said all I'm going to say about it. The uh, uh, and you know this coming week, apparently you weren't on at the beginning of the webinar uh, for a lot of various reasons. I'm taking a break for the summer, and uh, 
some of those reasons are because the country's opening up and people are going to want to spend time out. I mean, I, we haven't been out of the house for a month. I'm going stir crazy. We don't, we don't go places anyway, because I'm in a wheelchair. My wife's not in much better shape than I am, but, uh, um, we do, uh, you know, I know we want out of the house, so I'm sure you more healthy and, uh, uh, you more healthy people, uh, more active people certainly want to get out of the house. You know, springtime's here, summer's on the way and, you know, lots of wonderful activities. We usually, uh, go down in numbers in the summertime anyway. But also I have a selfish reason and my selfish reason is that I've been doing this for over three years and frankly, I'm tired. I need a break. I really need a break. So, uh, we're taking off for the summer. We're going to start this. This is the last presentation in the series. We're going to start the series, uh, over again, whenever we take back up at the end of the summer and course by then i don't know about you but i'll be biting at the bit to do this again but uh you know that's what we're going to do okay are there any other questions do we have any other questions or comments i welcome comments uh you know from time to time people tell me they think i'm full of baloney and that's fine i don't have any problem with that you're entitled to be wrong <laughs> so you know any other questions no other questions. Okay. Then, uh, my slide's not turning. I'm sure it turned for you. Uh, golly, come on. There we go. If you do have any other questions, uh, don't hesitate for a second to go to Joe com. Go to the ask Joe page. Uh, hopefully with the help of my, you know, the new help I've got from uh, this beautiful couple from Alabama, uh, J the Joe six back com website. When you come back, uh, if you visit it, whenever we start back up uh, or you refer people to it so that they can sign up for the free email course or, uh, get the invitations to these webinars. Hopefully by then it will have a facelift and be a whole a uh, new looking website. I'm, I'm anxious to, uh, uh, change the website. It really needs to be updated and I just don't have a lot of time for it. So my, our, my new found friend is going to help me with that. Uh, now let's go ahead and have a closing word prayer in the name of the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Now let us offer together the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, folks, listen. I've really enjoyed doing this with you. I've really enjoyed um, this whole, you know, this whole uh, 25 uh, presentation series. And I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you've learned from it. And I'm you know, even though I need a break, I'm really looking forward to coming back uh, to be with everybody at the end of the summer. And I hope in the meantime, you not only enjoy your newfound freedom that you're about to receive, but you also uh, encourage other people to begin attending and learning all they can. A recent uh, survey from EWTN Real Clear indicates that 82% of Catholics reject at least one or more uh, uh, teaching of the church. Well, if Jesus is God and he founded a church and he told us that we have to belong to it, that would mean they don't believe Jesus is God. 
but I really don't blame them because they haven't really been taught this ever, ever. So we need to learn everything that we can. And that's what these free webinars are all about. Somebody sent me a note. Thank you so very much for all you do for us. Have a great break and God bless. Well, you know what? I thank you too. I really do. I know you folks appreciate what I do. And uh, I appreciate you for being here because it tells me your head and shoulders um, uh, above a lot of Catholics, most Catholics, because you don't have apathy toward the faith. You want to really be good Catholics. And the first step in becoming a good Catholic or being a good Catholic is learning everything the church teaches. And that's what I want to go for. So I'll see you at the end of the summer. Y'all take care of yourselves. Don't make yourselves strangers. Contact me from time to time. Let me know how you're doing. Okay. Everybody have a great summer. Thank y'all and good night.